We arrived in the quaint coastal town on a sunny afternoon, the sea breeze promising a fresh start away from the chaotic city life we had known. I'm Mark, and alongside my wife Helen and our teenagers, Alex and Mia, we had just moved into an old house with a rich history. It was said to have once belonged to 19th century smugglers, a detail that added an air of mystery and excitement to our new home. It was Mia who stumbled upon the hidden entrance first. Hidden behind an old bookshelf in the basement, a wooden door cracked open to reveal a dusty, narrow passage stretching into darkness. Our initial excitement was palpable. We joked about treasure maps and secret meetings, caught up in the romance of our home's adventurous past. With flashlights in hand, we decided to explore just a little, telling ourselves we were just getting to know every part of our new home. But as we ventured deeper, the whimsy of our adventure began to fade. The tunnels weren't just relics, they were still in use. We found modern tools, a clear sign of recent work, along with packages that seemed far too new to be leftovers from centuries past. Most unsettling were the faint footprints in the dust, leading further into the shadowy labyrinth. A chill ran down my spine as the reality set in. These tunnels, these remnants of a bygone era, were part of something very much alive and ongoing. Fear mingled with intrigue as we faced the undeniable fact that our family had just moved into the heart of a smuggler's active hideout. It was just past dusk when Alex whispered to me, his eyes wide with a mix of fear and thrill. Dad, let's see where it leads tonight. Against my better judgment, I agreed. We tiptoed down into the basement, followed the old smuggler's tunnels, and found ourselves at a hidden cove under the moonlit sky. What we saw chilled me to the bone, a group of men unloading boxes from boats, their contents hidden, but obviously illicit. We crouched behind the rocks, barely breathing, until the last of them had disappeared. With hearts pounding, we hurried back through the tunnels, the weight of what we had seen pressing down on us. The next morning brought no relief. A man, his face obscured by the shadow of his hat, approached me as I fetched the morning paper. His message was simple. Keep your family quiet about last night. Forget what you saw. The threat hung heavy in the air as he walked away. Later, Helen noticed a car that didn't belong in our small town cruising slowly past our house. By evening, another unfamiliar vehicle joined the first. The message was clear. We were being watched. Every creak of our old house that night sounded like a warning. By the third day of surveillance, Helen and I knew we couldn't go to the police. There was no telling how deep the smuggler's influence ran in our new town. Instead, we turned to an old friend, Peter, who had been a fisherman in these waters all his life. I trusted him with our lives as I explained our plan over a secure line. We need to get out using the smuggler's routes. Can you meet us? I asked. He didn't hesitate. I'll be there. Just tell me when. We chose the night of the next big shipment, knowing the smugglers would be preoccupied. That night would be our chance to escape this nightmare. We started to prepare, gathering our most important documents and a few belongings, each of us aware that if our plan failed, returning to our quaint coastal dream would be impossible. The night was moonless, the darkness almost palpable as we quietly packed our most essential belongings. Helen clutched the family photo albums while Alex and Mia grabbed backpacks filled with clothes and personal items. We couldn't take much, Speed was more critical than ever. We descended into the tunnels, the air thick with dampness and the echo of our cautious steps. I led the way, a flashlight our only guide through the snaking underground labyrinth that had terrified and fascinated us since our move. We dodged unfamiliar traps and evaded newly noticed surveillance cameras, evidence of a well-guarded secret route used by the smugglers. As we neared the exit, leading to the hidden cove, our path was suddenly blocked by two figures emerging from the shadows. Going somewhere, one sneered, his voice cold as the sea air. My heart raced, but my mind raced faster. I whispered a quick plan to Helen, who nodded, understanding immediately. She and the kids retreated a few steps, then loudly clattered a rock down a side passage as a decoy. As the smugglers turned towards the sound, we seized the moment. I lunged forward pushing past them with a strength fueled by sheer desperation, leading my family towards the faint light of the exit. Our breaths were heavy as we emerged onto the rocky cove, 
the salt air hitting us with the harsh reminder of our peril. There, as promised, was Peter, his old fishing boat bobbing gently in the water. We wasted no time. The kids clambered aboard first, followed by Helen, and then myself. Just as the engine roared to life, shouts and the beam of flashlight sliced through the darkness behind us. The smugglers had realized our ruse. Hold on, Peter yelled over the noise as he skillfully navigated the boat away from the looming danger and out into the open sea. Safely away from the town, we contacted the federal authorities to report the smuggling operation. Thanks to the evidence we provided, the operation was dismantled. We relocated to a new state under new identities provided by witness protection. Though safe, our harrowing adventure left us wary but bonded closer than ever. A year later, we had adapted to our new life in a different part of the country. The story of our narrow escape circulated as an anonymous tale of courage and cunning, inspiring others facing threats to take bold actions for their safety. When Timmy and I first moved to Eden, it seemed like the perfect place to start anew. The lawns were manicured, the house is pristine, and every neighbor had a welcoming smile. At the community's grand welcoming party, I started noticing just how closely everyone adhered to the neighborhood rules, almost obsessively so. The watch members, friendly yet unnervingly attentive, mingled among us, their eyes always scanning, always noting. It was the first hint that Eden might not be as perfect as it appeared. In the following weeks, the sense of being constantly observed grew overwhelming. No matter the hour, I'd catch glimpses of someone lingering just a bit too long near our windows, or an unmarked van cruising slowly past our home. Timmy, ever so sensitive, clung to me more than usual, whispering about the scary men who watched him play in the yard. We felt trapped in an open-air prison, where our every move was monitored. It wasn't long before the charming facade of Hidan began to crumble, revealing something far more sinister underneath. It was late one evening when Timmy and I decided to take a shortcut home through a less traveled path behind our block. That's when we saw it. A group of neighborhood watch members standing over what looked like a body. Panicked, I pulled out my phone and started recording, my hands trembling. I thought we were hidden by the shadows, but as we tiptoed away, one of the watchmen turned and looked straight at us. The next morning, I found a note tucked under our doormat. Forget what you saw, for your family's sake. But how could I? Knowing what lay beneath Eden's perfection, how could I possibly forget? The veiled threats escalated quickly. One morning, I found our front door smeared with a dark, sticky substance that reeked of intimidation. Another day, Timmy's beloved bike, left in the yard, was mangled beyond repair. Notes followed, each more ominous than the last, alluding to dangers that might befall us if we continued to be curious. They were watching, always watching, tightening the noose with each passing day. It was a message loud and clear. Conform or suffer. My fear for Timmy's safety grew with each incident, pressing the urgency of our situation deep into my heart. In the midst of our growing despair, Mrs. Kessler, an elderly widow who had always kept to herself, approached me during one of my forced smiles at a community gathering. Her eyes, sharp and knowing, suggested a clandestine solidarity. Over cups of tea in her overly floral living room, she whispered the true history of Eden. It was founded by a group with utopian ideals that had twisted into something dark and controlling. She too had seen too much, suffered losses. With Mrs. Kessler's knowledge and my resolve, we plotted. To the outside, I played the role of a compliant and great a full resident even volunteering for extra duties, allowing me deeper insights into the community's operations. Using the information gathered during my volunteer hours, I meticulously mapped out our escape. The community's annual festival, lauded for its extravagant fireworks and all-night revelry, provided the perfect cover. I stockpiled essentials, food, water, spare clothes, all hidden in false bottoms of storage bins. I taught Timmy secret codes and signals, turning them into a game so he wouldn't succumb to fear. We rehearsed our route, memorizing each turn and each landmark that would lead us to the old maintenance gate. Mrs. Kessler had told me it was no longer used but fortuitously forgotten in the community's security updates. Each night, after Timmy slept, I lay awake, planning each detail. 
Each step of our flight from Eden, the weight of our future pressed heavily on me, but the thought of freedom, of safety for Timmy, fortified my resolve. The festival was approaching, and with it, our only chance to disappear into the night, to reclaim the lives that were rightfully ours. The night before the festival, I moved with silent urgency through the shadows of our home, deleting emails and clearing browser histories. Every message I had sent from my phone that could lead them back to us, I erased. I left nothing that could speak of our plans or our fears. In the dim light of early dawn, I meticulously arranged our beds to look as if we were still sleeping, pillows under the covers forming deceiving shapes. Then, with trembling hands, I sent the last email to a journalist I had once met, attaching all the evidence of Eden's dark secrets. It was done. There was no turning back. The festival was in full swing, the air thick with laughter and the sky ablaze with fireworks. Timmy and I, our faces partially obscured by festive masks, moved through the crowd. My heart pounded in my ears with each step, fearing every glance our way was one of suspicion. But the community was engrossed in celebration, oblivious to our silent descent. We reached the old maintenance gate at the edge of Eden. As I fumbled with the lock, a firm hand fell on my shoulder. It was the head of the neighborhood watch, his face grim, knowing. His grip tightened as he leaned in close, his words a hissed warning of the consequences of leaving. But as he spoke, a larger, final burst of fireworks lit up the night. And in that brief, illuminating chaos, I pulled Timmy towards me and shoved the watch leader away with all my might. We ran, the gate swinging open just enough to slip through. Behind us, alarms began to sound, a cacophony rising against the festive noises. We didn't look back, not even as the distant sound of sirens grew signaling the approach of the police. Hours later, hidden safely away in the shadows of a quiet diner's back booth, Timmy and I watched the early morning news on a muted television. Images of police cars outside Eden's gates flickered across the screen. A reporter spoke of an investigation, of a community shaken by revelations. We held hands, our grip a silent vow of never returning, of never forgetting. We had escaped Eden, but we had also set the truth free. A year has passed since Timmy and I fled the confining walls of Eden. We now find ourselves in a new town, a place marked by its unremarkable normalcy, which to us feels like a sanctuary. I've exchanged secretive glances and coded whispers for open smiles and community meetings. I'm actively involved with a local group that supports individuals escaping from controlling environments like Eden. It's work that heals both the helper and the helped. And every story shared is a reminder of the shadows we left behind. Timmy, with the resilience only children possess, has blossomed in this fresh soil. His earlier timidity, once a constant companion, has been replaced by a burgeoning confidence. He has friends who know nothing of high walls or watchful eyes. Friends who have only ever known schoolyard games and birthday parties. He's thriving in school his report card a mosaic of high marks and teacher's praises, a stark contrast to the fearful glances he once cast over his shoulder. From our small but cozy home, I watch him play outside, his laughter a balm to the scars of our past. we found peace, or perhaps it's peace, that has found us. Yet, even as we build this new life, I remain vigilant. The past, with its dark tendrils, sometimes tries to creep into the tranquility of our present. I've always cherished solitude. Amid the bustling chaos that defined urban living, I found my peace in the quiet moments. Early mornings when the city still slumbered, late nights when the streets emptied of their daily throngs. This love for tranquility guided my decision to move to a new city, a place where I could start over with a clean slate, where memories didn't cling to the corners of buildings, and faces in the crowd were all unfamiliar to me. Here, in this sprawling metropolis that buzzed with strangers, I sought my fresh start. I relished the anonymity, the freedom to rebuild myself away from the prying eyes of a past that had become too heavy to bear. My new apartment was a modest but cozy space, nestled on the quieter side of town. Work became a necessary intrusion into my carefully curated isolation, a demanding job that nonetheless offered the routine I had craved. It was predictable, manageable. 
Life, for a few precious months, felt pleasantly uneventful. However, I would soon learn that tranquility was a fragile state. It began with a niggling sensation, the kind that tugs at the edges of awareness. A car, nondescript and black, lingered a little too long in my rearview mirror as I drove home from work. Once, twice, perhaps it was nothing, a coincidence of timing, I told myself. But as days bled into weeks, the car's presence wove itself into the fabric of my daily commute, an unsettling shadow trailing my movements. Initially, I dismissed the feeling, chiding myself for succumbing to baseless paranoia. Yet the human mind is finely tuned to detect patterns, and what I pieced together refused to be ignored. The repetition of the car's appearances, always a few turns behind, transformed my dismissal into concern. This unease was new, an unfamiliar weight in my stomach. I had moved to escape ghosts, only to find myself haunted by a very real specter in the form of a vehicle that seemed as much a part of my journey home as the streets I navigated. In the weeks that followed, my home, once a bastion of safety, began to betray me. It started so small and inconsequential that I could almost convince myself I was imagining things. A book misplaced, not on the shelf where I was certain I'd left it, but on the coffee table. My keys, always hung by the door, found in the kitchen. These discrepancies niggled at me, sowing seeds of doubt in the routines I had so meticulously established. Then, there was the scent, an odd, indefinable aroma that didn't belong. It was neither unpleasant nor familiar, a melange of something metallic mixed with the earthiness of aftershave, lingering in the air like a ghostly presence. It clung to my living room some evenings, greeting me as I returned from work, a silent testament to an uninvited visitor. Most disturbing, however, was the shadow. On one particularly ordinary evening, as I moved about my kitchen, a movement at the periphery of my vision caught my attention. A fleeting glimpse of something or someone passing by my living room window. I froze, my heart hammering, and rushed to peer outside, only to find the street empty, bathed in the orange glow of the streetlights. The curtains, I could have sworn, were drawn when I had gotten home. Confusion turned to fear, and fear bred isolation. I reached out, first to friends, then to the local police, in search of explanations, validation, or perhaps just to hear someone else say they believe me. But reassurance was scant. Friends offered well-meaning platitudes, suggesting perhaps I was overworked, stressed, or simply not yet accustomed to my new home. The police were polite but clear, without evidence of forced entry or theft. There was little they could do. They left me with a pamphlet on home security and suggestions to change my locks, but no real solace. This lack of belief, this dismissal of my concerns, left me adrift in my own mind, questioning my sanity. The solidity of my reality, once unquestionable, now seemed permeable, subject to distortions that left me grappling for truth. Nightfall brought no relief, each creak and whisper of my apartment, a potential herald of unseen intrusion. Sleep, when it came, was fitful, plagued by dreams of shadows and the sensation of being watched. I found myself caught in a space, where the boundary between the real and imagined blurred. The solitude I once sought now felt like a sentence, a confinement with my burgeoning fears for company. The very walls that were meant to protect me seemed complicit in my torment, keeping silent vigil over my unraveling. In this state of heightened vigilance, I began to see my world through a lens tinted with suspicion and dread. Every unexplained sound, every slight anomaly in my home's order became evidence of my unseen adversary's presence. This escalation of events did more than just invade my personal space. It breached the fortress of my mind, planting seeds of terror that took root deep within my psyche. I was left to navigate a reality where the line between paranoia and legitimate fear became increasingly indistinguishable. Determined to confront my fears head-on, I steeled myself for the inevitable encounter. It came on an evening painted with the strokes of an ordinary sunset, the kind that previously would have passed without remark. The black car, its presence now a constant in the tapestry of my daily life, was there again. This time, however, it followed me all the way to my parking lot unraveling the last thread of my patience. With a courage born of desperation, I approached the vehicle, 
my steps echoing in the silent street. The driver's door opened, and out stepped a figure, shrouded in the dimming light. A man, unfamiliar, his features cast into shadow by the failing light, stood before me. My heart raced, not with fear, but with a burning need for answers. I'm not here to hurt you, the stranger began, his voice laced with an urgency that made me pause. I'm trying to protect you. Before I could fully process his words, a sudden disturbance shattered the moment, a noise from my apartment. Together, we rushed towards my home, an uneasy truce between us forged in the face of a common threat. What we discovered inside turned my world on its head. Hidden cameras, expertly placed to capture every corner of my living space, blinked back at us. The invasion I had felt, the eyes I had sensed upon me, had not been the imaginings of a mind pushed to the brink. They were real. But the man before me, whom I had labeled as my stalker, was just as much a victim. He explained hurriedly how he had noticed the car first, how his attempts to warn me had been misinterpreted. He too had felt the weight of unseen eyes, noticing similar devices in his own home after he had taken an interest in my safety. The realization dawned on me like a cold wave. The true architect of our fear remained cloaked in the shadows of anonymity, manipulating us both in a sinister game of voyeurism. The presence of the cameras, their silent testimony to countless observed moments, suggested a plot far more disturbing than a simple case of stalking. Someone, for reasons unknown, was orchestrating our fears, feeding off our paranoia like a parasite. This twist of fate, the revelation that my presumed stalker was, in fact, an ally, forced me to reassess my situation. Together, we faced not just the invasion of my privacy, but a deeper, more pervasive threat. The identity of our watcher, the mastermind behind the lenses, remained a mystery. One that promised to unravel the very fabric of our reality. With the revelation that my stalker was, in fact, another pawn in this disturbing game, I found myself in an unlikely alliance. The man, whom I learned was named Lucas, shared my determination to unearth the identity of our observer. Together, we embarked on a mission fueled by the need for answers and justice, a mission that would require all our cunning and bravery. Our first step was to trace the origin of the surveillance equipment. It was a painstaking process, involving late-night research sessions, poring over manuals, and following the tangled web of technology that had invaded our lives. We discovered that the devices were not the off-the-shelf variety, but rather specialized equipment that required professional knowledge to install and operate. This clue narrowed our list of suspects significantly. As we delved deeper, we uncovered a network of signals that led us to a most unexpected source. Our neighbor, Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson was a retiree, a seemingly benign presence in the building who often greeted us with a smile and small talk about the weather. His demeanor was the perfect cover for the malice that lurked beneath. Confronting Mr. Thompson required a plan. We could not simply accuse him without undeniable proof of his involvement. Thus, Lucas and I decided to turn the tables on our watcher. Using our newfound knowledge, we tampered with the surveillance equipment, sending false signals to lead Mr. Thompson into a trap. The trap was set in my apartment, the scene of so many violations of my privacy. We waited, tense and silent. As Mr. Thompson took the bait, he entered the apartment, confident in his control over the situation, only to find Lucas and me waiting for him, our faces grim with accusation. The confrontation that followed was tense. Mr. Thompson, realizing his scheme had unraveled, oscillated between denial and anger before finally breaking down and confessing. His motives were as chilling as they were unfathomable. He spoke of a twisted obsession with me, a desire to control and manipulate my environment to make me dependent on him. He saw himself as a guardian, albeit one who had crossed into the realm of criminality. Lucas and I listened, horror-struck by the depth of Mr. Thompson's delusion. We had expected to confront a predator, but what we found was a man lost in his own distorted reality. Yet, the danger he posed was no less real. With the confession secured, we called the police, who arrived to take Mr. Thompson into custody. I felt a wave of relief wash over me. 
the immediate threat had been neutralized. Mr. Thompson was now in the hands of the authorities, his array of surveillance equipment confiscated, and his intentions laid bare. The ordeal had left scars, undoubtedly, but also a resilient bond between two strangers who had become allies in the face of adversity. But just as I began to envision a return to normalcy, a chilling reminder of my vulnerability arrived. A text message from an unknown number pierced the fragile bubble of my newfound security. You think you've won, but you're still being watched. The message was cryptic, its source untraceable, reigniting the ember of fear that I had fought so hard to extinguish. In the ensuing days, my efforts to trace the message proved futile. It was as if the sender existed in the shadows, beyond the reach of light. This realization, that our victory over Mr. Thompson might have been but a battle in a larger war, cast a long shadow over my recovery. As the final words of my ordeal whispered into silence, I found myself drawn to the window, gazing out into the night. The city stretched out before me, a maze of lives unknowingly observed, each light a potential eye, each shadow a concealment for darker intents. My reflection in the glass, superimposed on this panorama, served as a poignant metaphor for the duality of my existence.